Now for chairing the next session, I am requesting Dr. Chandran Guha, Jadavpur University, to please come up on the dais. Now may I request Dr. Mohasan Asadi to come up on dais. Dr. Asadi uh, is from Department of Energy and Petroleum Technology University of Stavanger, Norway. I'm requesting Dr. Asadi to, de uh, to deliver his speech on energy transition and sustainable development. Very well. Thank you very much. And thanks for the invitation. As we used to say in our uh, yoga lecture, Namaste. So it's a little bit of uh, diversion from the very detailed analysis to a helicopter view of what is actually energy transition and sustainability. And the question is whether it is easy or difficult. I used to say that if it was easy, then it was done already. So most probably it is not so easy. It is why we are still challenging and walking around and trying to find solutions for that. So what I'm going to try to give you is more of a big picture view and trying to put in place a little bit of a connection between what opportunities and what limitations we might expect happening. So the overview says that it is a knowledge-based development will be required. So everybody has their own opinion. Some believes that the tipping point has already passed. Some believe that it is very close. Some believe that there is no tipping point at all. So we are not going to follow our wishes or our expectations, trying to stick to the knowledge, so to say. The climate change possibilities for finding solutions. Are there any? If they are, how they look like and what issues are there? We finally need to think globally but act locally. That is because of that the circumstances are different for different countries, different regions, different, uh, let's say, organizations. So they need to stick to their own abilities and so. And finally, if Education Institute has any role to play. So, before starting that, I will go give a couple of definitions in a way that we all are agreed on what we are talking about. First of all, when I'm saying intermittent renewables, then I mean wind and solar. That means that it is not under our, uh, let's say, command. The wind is coming and going when it wants, and the sun appears and disappears when it wants. So it is intermittent because every time we have them, then we can produce the electricity or heat. If we don't, then we cannot. So who is deciding over them? It is a little bit over our course, so to say. Then I'm going to mention dispatchable generation. This is the opposite to the intermittent generation, which means that it is under our, demand, let's say, command, we can push a button, start to generate, or stop the, uh, let's say, reduce the amount or increase, etc. so we can actually control it. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about the co uh, frequency control or grid stability. To do that, we need a couple of seconds to discuss a little bit about what does it mean, and my explanation or as an example for that to simplify it is that when you are driving a car on a road then there is a speed limit and the uh, expectation is that everybody are sticking to the speed limit and driving their car according to the limit given. Frequency is the same for the distribution grid which means that there is a speed which is fixed here 50 hertz so that is a speed we have to stick to. However, there is a certain flexibility when you are driving on the road with a 50 kilometer, kilometers per hour as a speed limit. If you get to 45 or 47 or 51, 53 
no police gonna appear and nobody gonna find you or put you into jail, but obviously if you go down to 20 or drive with 100 kilometer per hour, then somebody gonna come and catch you. The same is with the grid. If the deviation from the constant speed, which is 50 hertz, will become too big, then there is a controller which is going to stop the generator to save the generator from explosion. And the generator is actually the connection between the power plant and the grid. So we need to understand that, that the power plant is responding to the demand of the grid. If the load on the grid goes up, the velocity goes down, the frequency fall, and this signal from the generator goes to the power plant and the power plant increase the amount of power produced. However, there is certain limit for that and in time as well as in magnitude. And that is important to understand because this is the major issue which need to be solved and everybody talk about the smart grids and all this kind of stuff, what it is and how does it work, it is too much of detail, but at least we have to understand that the grid has certain limits and that gonna have certain consequences. Given that, then we are talking about flexible generation. What is flexible generation? Is generation units which have a fast response time, which means that if suddenly sun disappears under the clouds and we lose certain number of megawatts, during that very short period of time, we need to bring up an alternative generation, which is going to replace the amount of power lost due to the disappearance of the sun. And those we call flexible generation. They are flexible in terms of startup shutdown as well as change of the load. And we're gonna have a discussion about those. I can just mention that when it comes to nuclear plants, the response time for a starting up one is about days. When it is about the nuclear, the, the coal power plant, then it is about hours. When we are talking about the combined, do you have a discussion there as well? You can join here then. Uh, so, uh, the next is the combined cycle plants. And the combined cycle plants are reacting within minutes, tens of minutes, and then we do have the gas turbines which are reacting within single minutes, so to say. So this is a little bit about what flexibility and the speed are we talking about. Then we do have the storage. This is another bridging element. And this one is whether we are doing to store electrons then we are talking about batteries. Or we are going to store molecules, then it means that we are talking about gas, such as hydrogen. If we are talking about heat, then obviously we are talking about kilowatts or megawatts of thermal energy to be stored, etc. So there are different options for storage, and they have different consequences and different technologies. So, obviously, demand response, which means that electricity is a thing that we are generating that we need it. So, a storage is, a, right now at least, it's very seldom that we do have this kind of opportunities. So, because of that, when the demand goes up, then we have to produce accordingly. If demands go down, we have to reduce accord accordingly. So this is important to understand because this is our major challenge today. Obviously, we need also have security of supply because many of the installation, technologies, banks, God knows what, all are dependent on secure supply of electricity. If the electricity goes for a couple of minutes, it's going to be a catastrophe if we cannot manage to uh, keep in alive all those technologies and installations which are electricity dependent. So, we are facing a new challenge today called sustainable development, 
And we have here the presentations already today before launch as well, what is sustainable, what is sustainability, etc. So there are so many questions and so few answers. However, I do believe that the educational organization have a role to adjust the education program to train and educate the next generation in a way that they are equipped for handling all those new questions and those new demands which are different from what we have been used to. Coming to the global warming, climate change, etc., obviously there are some who don't believe in that, some believe in it, some do something else. However, what is for sure here is that people are starting to, let's say, feel it approaching to them at a, at a level that the, let's say, burning uh, in the Australia, or it is about a couple of months later after all these uh, fires, then it is flooding, etc. Those people, they do feel that there is some change happening. In Norway, during the New Year Eve, when the temperatures used to be minus 30 degrees some in north, it was plus 17 degrees and people were very happy and they were swimming in the sea. So it means that global warming might also have good sides for some. Anyhow, going to the education program. So we need to train people who are trained differently compared to the the standard classical education programs we have. And given that, we need to change our education programs. The question is, how do we do that? Obviously, we need to have multidisciplinary programs, which means that tomorrow's engineer cannot only stick to thermodynamics or fluid dynamics or so. They need to understand both the economical aspects, the social aspects, the political aspects, and all other aspects of the sustainability and energy development. Uh, it has been several attempts. Here in Jadavpur University, we do have a, uh, two, actually, projects together with Jadavpur University where we have been looking into, uh, let's say, how we can modernize the energy education programs and find the gaps, establish bridging the gaps, and what we have come to conclusion is that uh, the basic understanding of the sustainability is something that we need to first put in place. And then the question is, do we really always need to have new definitions or are there old definitions that could help us to find out what it is and how to do it? I was thinking about that and talking to my Dear wife, who is a yoga teacher, and we ended up with that, that maybe the definition was given for several thousand years back here in India in a way that when they say yoga has two rules. The first one is cultivating conscious awareness, which means that actively trying to increase our awareness about what is it about. When we have understood it, then we need to restore the balance. And thinking about the situation which is today, obviously those two are the basic fundament of understanding and reacting to that. And that would be sufficient to have a rather good understanding of how can we restore the balance so that we don't lose this battle, so to say. And I do believe that the education programs from very early stage to university stage need to put this understanding in place that we need to actively look for knowledge to understand what is happening and why and then try to sort out what can we do about it so that we can restore the balance. Uh, this curve is an interesting one. I'm going to walk you through this. What does it show is that there is energy demand in the world, it shows the CO2 emission for that energy which has been produced. It shows 1990 and 2017. 
which means that due to the increase of the activities as well as the number of human beings on the earth, we have been forced to increase our production of the energy to meet the demand. In the same time, we have been using fossil fuels, which has resulted in increase of the emission of the CO2. Obviously, in 2040, business as usual means we are going to have even more people and more demand for energy. And if we continue as we have been doing there, then we are reaching another level of CO2 emissions. And we are not happy with that because if the tipping point has passed or is passing, then we need to do something about it. There is something which is shown as new policies, which means that there is certain agreement in place already. And based on that, if we fulfill those requirements, then in 2040, we should have smaller need for energy, which means that we are implementing energy efficiency. And by being more efficient, we can provide a larger number of people with less growth in the energy production. And we can reduce the emission in terms of utilizing renewable or, let's say, clean energy technologies. However, if we think about the last one, which is sustainable development, as it is defined, then it means that in 2040, we should have no more usage of electric energy, which means that we should stick to that what we have, independent of the number of people growing on the earth and the amount of energy demand, etc. At in the same time, reduce the amount of CO2 emission considerably compared to what we are looking to here. Then we ask ourselves, how are we are going to do that? Obviously, energy efficiency can be implemented. That is for sure. But what do we do with the CO2 emission? We can see the same figure presented differently. In this way, it says that there are certain renewable generation. What we have when the study was made, 2017, and what is required according to these new strategies, so to say. It is a considerable growth. However, this sustainable development requires much more of that. If we look at the electric car fleets for the transportation, obviously we see that the demand of growth is huge to reach those goals. The same for the carbon capture and the storage. So our instruments to fulfill those requirements and those, let's say, agreements which we have already signed up is <laughs> very challenging and very demanding. So we need to understand the challenges before we jump up of happiness and think that we are solved the problem. So given that, a third way of looking into that is energy efficiency and renewable. Those two need to contribute with a major amount so that we can realize those goals. OK, keep it there. Taking one step back, looking into what's happening in India. In India, we have the key data given here. Interestingly, about total primary energy supply, during 2007 to 2017, which means that in one decade, we have had 55% increase. For the energy production, 31%, and for the total consumption, 50%. And what is the expectation is that the next coming decade, which is from now to 2030, it is expected that the energy consumption of India will more than double, and the electricity consumption will more than triple. And in the same time, we are chasing those developments for reduction of the emissions and energy efficiency and all that. Then one can ask, 
We have a very uh, ambitious target for installation of solar energy, etc., and we have already in India managed to put a certain number of megawatts into operation, etc., etc. Then the question is, is that sufficient? Even if we double it up, was that, will it be sufficient? Thinking of that the growth is so big that the addition of the renewable we are talking about is not even sufficient to cover the growth itself. Something food for thought. Once again, the same about the final consumption. As you can see, it is growing continuously, and it's going to go like that next step. What this curve shows is that to fulfill what we have today, there is a need for import here, that box which is dotted lines, to fulfill the balance here. So if this one grows, how much of the other one do we need to bring in? How much more import dependent will India be? And where is it imported from? What is imported? How? And so on. Very well. Understanding of what is happening is high share of intermittent renewables, which is our solar and wind, which is going to save us and which is going to do all those things which we are talking about, is telling us that the power will be produced when it is possible, not when it is needed. And how do we match that one then? This is a big question to bring home and think about it. Let's have a look at the renewable energy. What we can see here is that during the few years, the learning curves, as it is called, for wind and for solar shows that we have been able to push down the cost per megawatt hours produced so we can do it cheaper. And then maybe it goes like that. It says there are dot lines, dotted line. It says that it goes down. How far does it go? So the question is, when are we hitting the bottom of this reduction of the costs? The next curve shows that maybe we have already reached that. It is saturated to a certain level, meaning that the drop has already happened and passed. So marginal reductions will be possible, but major reductions, no. So the cost will be there. So hoping for that, that everything is going to cost almost nothing to be installed, it is a wrong thinking. So it is better to think differently. Then it is about the installation of all those requiring a space. Where are we going to put those? Solar cells, wind turbines. Do we have the land mass required for that or not? Obviously, there are some smart solutions. This shows a parking slot in uh, California, showing that the parking slots, it can, utilize, it can be utilized for solar cells, creating shade, reducing the heating of the cars, and producing electricity, etc. So obviously, we can do some more smart solutions, but the question is, where are the limits? How much of that? This curve shows one month's electricity production in California. California is very similar to India because it is very much solar-based. And what we can see here is about the, uh, let's say, dispatchable load and renewable generation. So electricity is produced when possible, not when it is needed. And what is the consequence? If we cannot store it, then we have to stop producing. It is all what we can do. There is no other option. So we have the installation, we have pay for it, it is in place, but we cannot use it because we don't need the power when it is produced. 
and we don't have the storage capacity, so it is better to turn everything off. So there is a gap. The gap needs to be bridged by the storage. So the storage becomes a key element. However, not only storage is going to solve the problem, because we are facing another problem, as it is called the dock curve. What does the dock curve say? The dock curve says that our energy demand has been like this, the gray line here, in California. Thanks to installation of solar energy, we have produced certain amount of that by solar energy so that the amount which is produced by dispatchable load or dispatchable generation has been reduced to the blue line. The next year to the next, next gray line and next and next and next. So we, are, we need less and less of this fossil fuel based energy thanks to installation of more and more solar. But does it come without any consequences? No. And what are the consequences? Obviously, what is happening here is that this is our peak. The peak is not changing so much as you can see. It is growing. The only thing which is happening is that we need more at the peak time. The question is when the peak happens. The peak happens after the sunset. When everybody go home, start the air conditioning, start to watch TV, make food, blah, blah, blah. So we need much more energy when we cannot produce it by solar anymore. What is the consequence? The consequence is that we have a ramping rate which is unbelievable. We need to produce hundreds of megawatts within a very short period of time so that flexible generation in a large number will be required to fulfill this gap and not any kind of flexible generation. So, are we creating new headaches and questions and problems by installing a lot of renewable energy or are we solving the problem? Important to keep in mind. I don't know how I do with the time. I think that I have already used about 15 minutes or so. So this is the situation which we have had or we have in many countries still living in that way that we have central generation units and those are feeding into a grid which is built up to bring the power from the centralized power plants down to the consumers. And between the generation and the consumption, in this grid we are putting a little bit of wind and a little bit of solar which is still manageable. It is not a big problem. However, when we have installed a lot of those renewables down there, then we turn the direction, we close all those fossil fuel based, etc. So we're going to become dependent on another kind of grid, which is not the one which we have built, because we built it for other kind of purposes and cons constraints, so to say. It is also cost. Making the grid smart, it is not like that, that we tell him, be smart and everything is solved. It is going to cost money, efforts, understanding, learning, uh, risk analysis, and so. So, summarizing everything, it says that there is a demand. We need to cover it in a way that the frequency is con constant. And we are providing that by wind and solar and intermittent renewables. If these renewables are not sufficient to cover it, then we have to start our conventional power plant, which are dispatchable. We can push the button and solve it so that we get the balance back again to zero, restoring the balance. Or if it is too much produced, then we need to kill it or store it. So storage doesn't come for free either. It is either batteries, which we have seen that there is a certain limitation, but that costs a lot of material, money, everything. And there is possibility for the storage of the hydrogen, 
but producing the hydrogen, transporting the hydrogen, changing our applications for hydrogen, this is not even for free. That is also something to think about. So, the energy transition, it is a journey. Every journey has a departure point and a target point, which means that moving from one point to another is going to take time. We need to select the best options along the way, utilize what we have. In the first place, we need to be smart, thinking about the national resources, available infrastructures, economy, acceptance of the people, etc. For every single country, which is completely different from one end to another end of the world. And we need to think globally, but we need to act locally, which means that a bottom-up approach needs to be implemented in the same time that we have a top-down support to make the things move and be in place. Important to understand is that everything is about balance. If we move one of those things hanging here, then the balance is collapsing. It is the thing connected to the grid. If we are adding new things and changing the balance or disturbing the balance, then we need to do something to restore it. Obviously, there are different routes. We can produce electricity, Strom from German language. It can be converted to heat. It can be converted to gas in terms of hydrogen. It can be used for transport and all other directions here and there. But every step between those has a certain efficiency level, which means that every conversion is going to cost losses in that system. That's also important to keep in mind. So we're going to have not only one solution. We need to bring everything to save the world. And the question is, what dimensions, what alternatives? This is to be solved by you, young people. I am already almost out of the game. And finally, summarizing, then we can say that definitely knowledge-based development and education is needed. We need to be more aware of what is going on, and we need to understand what balance needs to be restored. Global collaboration and resource allocation urgently to put the right solution in place. And this is not so easy today, as you have seen in the following of the news and the development of the uh, our world, system integration, interaction is on, very important to have a correct understanding. How do we integrate different parts of the system? And how do we understand the interaction between them to take the advantages and the opportunities and balance the requirements and difficulties? Finally, many challenges ahead, so we most probably need to move faster than we do today. It is about a very delicate balance, but it is possible, but requires a lot of training and a lot of resources. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ashadi, for your very informative lecture. And also thank you very much to finish it uh, sometimes before uh, your scheduled time. So we have got time for discussion. Now house is open to discussion. Uh, I uh, prefer uh, five questions at most. Uh, please ask Professor Asadi if you have any questions, please. Sir, uh, let me first congratulate you for your lucid delivery. Thank you. And uh, then whatever you have just projected, I have got a question to that, that we want development, but to what extent? Is there any question that will be different for 
different countries. Say, take India, for instance. How much development do you need? After that, we want sustainability. That is not defined. Supposing we want this much development, suppose everything will be uh, much more than what we feel. If you want this development, that comes down. But then we have not decided what, what should be the datum of the development. That much is my question. Yeah, this is um, a good question, but not easy to answer, because who is deciding what level of development are satisfactory for the country as such, for the individuals of the country as such. However, the people are the driving force in a way that they are voting to elect different people who are doing the job. So the decision is by the people. How much development? If you want to have the same standard as this and that and that country, then you need to have this and that level of development from the energy side, from the technology side, social side, etc. And given all these, obviously, it is not so easy to answer that question. I think that it is more about that conscious awareness of the people through the education should result in a decision based on knowledge to see what point of balance do they prefer. And given that, they are going to vote for those who are going to deliver it. To that part, of, I think this is a good one. But what I wanted to point out is, say we want that by 230, we must have this much power. There must be certain things of development that we would require that much power. Is there anything like that? that do we want this much development? Then we require this much power. If we do not want that much development, supposing we, we won't have that much requirement, but is there any limit to that or anything before researchers to find out? Yeah. If this country wants this much development. It is all about this, uh, uh, let's say, economical development in the first place. So there are certain, let's say, plans for the growth of the economy, always counted in GDP. And then you put up a target, say that we should reach that level. You say, okay, to reach that level, how much of growth do we need in terms of products, about the services, and so on and so on. So they do a calculation on the top level. They come to that end that for a growth of 7, 8, 10% per year, we will need so much energy due to the technologies which we have today. We know the technologies which we have today. We know how much energy they are requiring. And if we want to produce so much more, then we need to have so much more energy. And then they do these calculations. However, if they change their mind and do something else later on, this is the, uh, the figures given here are based on the, let's say, long-term plans provided by the countries. So I picked up only India, but there are all other countries there as well. So it is more about the ambitions. And given those ambitions, who is ruling that and how much it is relevant in five years or ten years, nobody knows. Nobody can predict the future. However, if you set up a goal, then you can calculate what is required to reach the goal with the knowledge you have today. And this is what these figures show. Beyond that, changes, improvements, all other, that is something to come. So I cannot predict it. I cannot say anything about it. I just can refer to what is printed on a paper. Thank you. Any other question? OK, I think there is no more question. So we conclude the session. Thank you very much.